stewardship and poor general incentive this summer was rooted in love. So it got me thinking about roots. Um, so every Thanksgiving, but also just sometimes me and Uncle Henry decided that our prayer before we eat, our grace, was the hymn we gather together. Because for us, that's roots, right? It's a pilgrim hymn. It takes us back to where our people come from, what our roots are. And so for Thanksgiving, he would lead the family and we gather together. Now, me and Uncle Henry were the two who remembered all the words to the verse because I just know the verse, first verse of every hymn. But you get past that first line, right? We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. We hasten and chasten God's will to make known. And then it gets a little less blessing-y. <laughs> the roots become a little, a little troubled at that point. Because God chastens and hastens. Okay, so, yeah, that's so. He hastens and chastens his will to make known. The wicked or pressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to the Lord. When I was thinking about that and the singing of that, it reminds me of my roots. Because I try to sing that with my family, but let's just say Reed and I are the only singers in the family. So it was an interesting combination of notes that happened at the table. <laughs> but it brings back these warm, fuzzy feelings of um, some of those Thanksgivings I had in my early 20s where all my cousins and aunts and uncles came together around grandma's table and the kids' table, which we were all grown-ups at that point, at the young adult table <laughs> where, we, where we shared. And one of the things that my grandmother wanted to teach us was about our roots, about where we came from and who we are. And so she would tell us the story of our ancestors. She would talk about the Mannings and the Robinsons and the Heathleys and the Gagers and the Pembers and any name that you find probably that came over on those first boats from the Mayflower we will find in my family tree because there weren't that many people. And so for me, I love those stories. I love that sense of here are people who were seeking out a place where they could practice their faith. A place where they were free to practice their faith. And then we created a lovely story about how the Native Americans saved us. But this week, as I was attending my, the annual celebration for the Illinois Conference, I took the course on Sacred Conversations of Race. And in that course, my roots got a little murky and troubled. In fact, they got very murky and troubled. Because let's face it, our roots are complicated. Because the story they told, which they also put as an either or proposition, right? So in my story, it was a good thing, we were escaping religious terror, tyranny and coming to America for freedom. In their story, we actually came here for economic dominance, which is part of the Pilgrim story. That they got a charter to set up the colony to create wealth and to gain wealth. Now, they didn't tell the whole story either because, like, you know what I did yesterday, right? I spent all day trying to find my roots and figure out what the real story is. I still don't know because it's complicated, right? 
I can, I can read the words of my ancestor. They saved the words of John Robinson, and I can read his sermons and see what he says about why people were going to America. In reading about those early pilgrims that he sent to America, what I learned is that when they went to the Netherlands, they ended up in two different places, and they ended up settling in Leiden because there they were allowed to practice the faith the way they wanted to practice it. But the problem was, a problem that everybody has when you're trying to convince your own group of people that this is the way to live, is that outside world has great music and food, right? And beautiful girls or boys that you could chase after, right? And so it turns out that the younger people were interested in learning the Dutch culture and wanted to interact with those other young people. But it also turns out that, that while they, they were telling me a story of economic domination, they left out that while the pilgrims were in Leiden, they were working in a factory and weren't making very much money, and in fact were pretty poor in that experience of where they were living there. That so, so there were economic reasons to leave because they didn't have the farmland that they were used to. They couldn't do some of the things that they needed to do. But they were accurate about the story of coming to America and taking the land. They were accurate in telling the story of the people who had to be displaced. But it's complicated, right? It's not an easy story, and it's not an easy explanation of my roots. Because they do have this sense of coming to America for religious freedom. Because the other story, the proud story my grandmother tells, is us be being related to Roger Williams. So if you trace back my grandmother's line, you can get me to one of his grandchildren, right? Or one of his children and therefore to him. So do you know who Roger Williams is? He's the founder of Rhode Island. And I was like, oh please let his story not be bad, right? As I was Googling yesterday. But what I discovered is, History is complicated, right? History is more than we've ever been told. Like, so the more you learn about anything, the more complicated you're going to find that story and history and roots are. So, the story that you would know about Roger Williams is that he founded Rhode Island because he believed in religious liberty and freedom. That Rhode Island was the state that gave us, in the Constitution, the separation of church and state. That it was because of Roger Williams and how he set up the charter for Rhode Island and the way the people of Rhode Island would be governed that we have some of the things that we have in our Constitution. But his story isn't that pretty. Because <laughs> when I went to discover it, what I discovered is that he came from a very rich family in England. And he was the rebel son pushing back against all of their ideas and beliefs. And so he was very well educated. And he wanted to be a pastor, but he had become part of the pietist tradition, that Puritan tradition of wanting to practice a faith that was purer than what they were getting in the Church of England or the Catholic Church. They wanted to get back to the roots. What was faith supposed to be about? But he was a little stern about this. Very charismatic, they described him as being very charismatic. But he challenged every place he went. So when he came over to Massachusetts, and they offered him a pastoral position. He turned it down because he didn't want to be Church of England. 
He would rather worship outside the status quo of what they had. And so he got into a lot of debates and conflict with those early settlers in New England. And he eventually ended up in Salem, where he caused all sorts of drama. So much drama that there were warrants for his arrest and they were going to put him on a boat, ship him back to England where he could end up in jail because of how he was speaking about the king. But part of the reason, right, that he is being arrested is not because of how he's speaking about the king, but how he's challenging their assumptions of power. About how he's challenging their understanding of what it means to live a life of faith in the ways they had set it up. And he became so strident at this point where he's in Salem, Massachusetts, that he believed that only basically him and his wife were going to be saved and go to heaven. And then came the letters of arrest and he learned of it and escaped into the wilderness. And this cracks me up because when you drive in Connecticut, it's like tiny. But if you're going by foot, I guess it would seem really big, right? <laughs> but so he had to escape from Salem and he ended up settling eventually in Rhode Island. Or what would become Rhode Island. But along the way, he made friends and he had made friends throughout the time he was in America of the native people. He learned a bunch of the different languages that they spoke. And so they helped him survive that winter. And somewhere along the way, in that trip from Salem to founding Rhode Island, he changed. He went from being a person who was intolerant of the beliefs and practices of other people to a belief that we needed to be open and tolerant of all. That we don't know who God's chosen people really are. And so it could be any of us in any of the faiths we practice, except he really had a thing against Quakers. And complicated, right? <laughs> So the end of his life, he ended up being that myth that we tell of the person who created a government and a system that said everybody's faith is welcome, that nobody's faith should control how we live our lives. But the journey to that spot was trouble. When we think about our roots, and how we're going to grow. We have to recognize that complicated nature and own it. That what I learned in that workshop for myself is that there are multiple stories of who we are. And we need to hear each of those stories. Because each of those stories has a part of the truth. But none of those stories has the complete truth, because it's complicated. So if we want to be rooted, if we want to be grounded in God and in love, how do we do that? Because I put up a complicated picture for you all. This is your ancestors, those of you who are from Hinkley. And it's from 1917. And do you know they did plays back then about immigration? That those are your ancestors talking about the goodness, the importance, the necessity of immigration. Roots are complicated. Can we learn from our roots? Like, are there bits and pieces of them that we need to know? Like in my family, that sense of finding our roots and knowing that we need to have 
the ability to grow in our relationship with God. That we shouldn't be stifled by the rules that are being told us about how we have to be. That God is bigger than that. That we need to be able to practice a faith that may push against what we've always had. But I wonder if you thought about your roots. Could you learn an important story about how they felt about immigrants that impacts how you think about immigrants today? When we think about being rooted in God, we think about how we have to change or how we have to how we have to, as the passage says, ground ourselves. Like, what is it that roots us in God? So one of the things about this space that I have always felt is you can feel the years and years and years in which people of faith prayed in this building. When you walk in, there is a real sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit in this building. Those are part of your roots. Have you tapped into them? How do you deal with your life of prayer? Your life of studying the word? Your life of figuring out what is true and important about history in the Bible, in our past? The things that we can learn from it the things that we need to question. And the love that can help us grow in new ways. Because that story of my ancestors about finding a place where you can practice your faith is important to me because it tells me that we are always growing and changing and they were always seeking something new. But my new learning is acknowledging and forgiving my ancestors for doing some horrible things. To get me to the place I am, they had to do things that I find reprehensible. And I need to own that, acknowledge it, accept it, and then work to change the ways that I can, to become rooted in a God who says that everyone belongs, everyone is welcome, everyone has a place at the table as an invited in. But that's been a long history to get there. It's been a long history, as Roger Williams teaches us, of going through a time of intolerance to get to a time of openness. And all of us have to struggle with those roots, those complications. And remember that. God is there with you in the times when we've really messed up to show us what grace and mercy looks like. God gives us the roots of forgiveness not so that we can continue doing the thing that we messed up with, but so that we can learn and grow and strengthen those roots that breathe that tree to life and bear the fruit of love to the world. Amen.